feminist for me is um, is a way of life. It uh, it means more than just uh, an ideology. It means that every day of my life, I I wake up and I know that in my very little ways, I have to trash the patriarchal norms, and I have to make my space enabling for uh, more women and more girls to speak up. It means a life for me. It is a way of life for me. The link between education and feminism is something I feel that to an extent I've, I've probably spent all my young life trying to um, trying to let the world see. So I'm a very uh, radical intersectional feminist and um, I believe in the power of education. I believe that I believe that we can reach the biggest of barriers through education. I, I believe education and knowledge is power. And if anybody uh, wants to actually actualize something as huge as gender equality and equality for humanity, then we should empower people with the knowledge and education to actually understand. Education is one of the most powerful tools for driving progress for gender equality and promoting girls' access to power, agency and leadership in adulthood. Dr. Avashi Sani is the founder and chief executive of the Study Hall Foundation in India. Education really is everyone's human right. So it's as much women's right as it is for men and boys. And it's also a very important resource. It's a very important resource. It's a very important transformative force, a personal transformative force. So Paula Freire would have it that it's a humanizing force. And if you were to leave 50% of the population out of the whole, uh, out of coverage, let's say, you know, or you're denying them this resource, this force, then of course you can never have gender equality. Delphine O, Ambassador for the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Secretary General of the Generation Equality Forum. When you put more girls in school, you create a virtual circle that will drive success for gender equality. When you think of it, when girls go to school and stay in school, because those are two different challenges, they have to go to school, but they stay in school until the end of secondary education. What do you have as positive results? Um, you have fewer unwanted pregnancies. You have fewer forced marriages. You are able to improve women's economic participation in the job market. You have are able to improve women's uh, political participation. Just more generally, you're really able to raise living standards and health standards of the entire family, not just a girl, but then the girl who is going to become the head of a household. Uh, if she is educated, she's going to be able maybe to, you know, to become an entrepreneur, to earn a living and so on and so on. Yet, millions of girls around the world are denied an education due to gender norms, which dictate what they can and cannot do. Girls may be marginalized from education for many reasons. A.B. Abrexen is the CEO of Plan International. There's still a gender gap in terms of access, particularly um, at the secondary uh, level. Um, social norms in, in society, communities everywhere still value girls' education less than boys. Um, so that's in and of itself a barrier. And as soon as a girl becomes an adolescent, uh, is grown up, starts menstruating, all, all the things that comes with adolescence, um, parents and society feel that her education attainment um, is less important. Fatu is a feminist leader and education activist with Plan International Sierra Leone. Being a feminist to me as a young lady from Sierra Leone means like everything in the world because growing up in my community, I had to see young girls at my age not going to school, not getting access to quality education just because they were girls. Lucia Fry, Director of Research and Policy at the Malala Fund. Girls are assumed to be destined for marriage, uh, for life in the domestic sphere, uh, often outside of the household that they've grown up in, whereas boys are more destined for formal thought types of work, to bringing in an income to the parental home. And so it's seen as a good investment 
to invest in boys' education rather than girls. But overcoming barriers to education for girls is just the first step. It's what happens in schools that is crucial for driving progress for gender equality. People talk about education being a very powerful transformative force. And I definitely think it is. But you know, only if it is, even only if education is transformed. Only if we took a look, take a very hard look at what we teach, why we teach it, and how we teach it. So, not just access to education, equal access to education, but also a, a kind of education that helps girls and boys think equally is extremely important for gender equality. And if you ask me, it's really the key thing. Because a lot of the inequality that exists, the unequal social structures, the unequal distribution of resources, the problem is really an unequal mindset. A mindset that thinks that women aren't of equal value and so they deserve less and so this much is enough for women. That is what leads and women accepting that. Thinking that yes, they're not equal and so they deserve and they deserve less. And that's all right. And so when you change those unequal mindsets and make them equal, you have women begin to drive their own equality as well. And so, of course, education is important, but more importantly, you need a certain kind of education in order to achieve gender equality. So what needs to change to unlock the gender transformative potential of education? Dr. Rita Bisnoff, head of the African Union International Center for Girls and Women's Education in Africa. What is important is to ensure that we have gender sensitive teaching and learning environments. What do we mean by this? By this we mean that it is important to have the curriculum which is gender sensitive, the teaching and learning resources which are gender sensitive, the administrative background, the environment which are gender sensitive. Too many countries still produce learning materials with gender stereotypes and few references to women and girls. A lot of school curriculums uh, miss out on the opportunity to showcase female role models, uh, showcase women in leadership positions, showcase women as scientists, as doctors. Um, and that means that girls growing up all over the world um, cannot be what they cannot see. So they're just not used to seeing women in leadership positions. And gender transformative education, if we really got that content piece right, we would reshape the way girls see themselves, their families see girls, and how society see girls, girls as a whole, which could move the needle on so many of the things that we need to move in terms of getting gender um, equality right. I never saw a mathematics book, a woman on the cover of a mathematics book, like teaching, doing something more impressive. All I saw was women in the kitchen cooking, women carrying water on their head, women carrying babies on their back. Men, men in the office, we need to change the way how we portray women in school. And for the homes, we need to give the mothers like the power, not just to look after the children and prepare food for them while they go to school. For education to empower girls and young women to become leaders and change makers, it must equip them with certain core competencies. Professor Erin Murphy Graham of the University of California, Berkeley. So when we think about uh, empowerment from a feminist perspective and empowering girls to be feminist leaders, um, I've worked with Cynthia Lloyd on a notion of empowering education for girls that has a core set of values and then core competencies. And the core values of that education system are dignity, that each individual is, is a dignified human being, equality, that that dignified human being's life is equal to that of others. So we have to eradicate ideas about inferiority that are often perpetuated by society. An education must have as an educational goal that girls learn to think themselves as equal, autonomous persons deserving respect. You must understand that a discriminatory social structure, 
people if they and this can be family structure either is wrong it's not natural god given it's historical it's socially constructed and it can be deconstructed it can be changed and then they must be led to imagine a world in which they are equal autonomous and the drivers of their lives living a life of their own choosing Louis Holt is the Director General of Social Development at Global Affairs Canada. We've seen that schools uh when they are working and when we're providing them uh with the right resources and supporting teachers um and be able who are able to offer quality education and supportive um environments that um girls can learn they can share their ideas uh they can work together around how they can support each other in their community and they grow to become leaders in their community um i tried in my beat to um make efforts to change the patriarchal uh, norms by uh bridging the uh knowledge gaps uh in nigeria so i've been making a whole lot of effort as we got education knowledge and capacity in because i believe that uh, uh when we give people more knowledge they will understand more uh so i'm presently running um and coordinating the national uh youth platform of action aid and uh, i'm obviously coordinating from a very feminist perspective and i presently uh or run uh, a feminist platform and organization which i founded this best to humanity some time ago where we started or we started creating these first school clubs in um uh, in schools uh, across uh, the country and um this was meant to be a feminist uh, school club but uh, at first we had to visit the schools and talk to them about feminism and be sure that we had people that were interested in joining and then the the other value is the idea of active learning So individuals learn by doing. And so these um educational spaces need to be spaces where we can learn by doing. They need to be participatory. So with those ideas at the core, then we've identified four different domains for empowering education. The first is the idea of critical thinking and learning. So we say that individuals need to develop the capability for critical thinking and that allows them to analyze their own lives and the social systems around them to work for change. Nani Zulmanani is the president of the Asia South Pacific Association for Basic and Adult Education. First in term of its curriculums the education system the curriculum of ed- in education system not only to give the knowledge and skill but also have to touch uh, the heart mind and also pers- perspective of the learners and the second the process of how the learning is delivered so it's not one way but it's through a process of building critical awareness based on a uh, live reality of the learners create debate around issues in the classroom don't spoon feed kids um answers to society's problems but have the kids themselves engage in debate because that's a huge skill that is necessary if you are to engage as a leader in a movement in politics etc many schools across the world have students participation in various school councils in forming and shaping the school etc and representation um as a student in these various student bodies is hugely formative uh for future leadership roles so what we do is going to these school clubs and empowering them with the knowledge to understand what feminism is and all the schools that we've been able to do this things we came into the educational space and we had female presidents in classrooms and these children are going to lead those schools and their mindsets are going to change for the better if we can give power to education if we can empower young girls and young women with knowledge and capacity and education then we must have solved 50% of gender issues 
education is power. And if we can link these two together, giving every child equal education, free, equal, and fair access to education, then we'll be creating a world where humans would be truly equal and free. A world where people would actually exist and understand that this person is human and I owe humanity to be nice and respect people's human rights. I think education and feminism are two things you just, you can't get them away from each other. We have to educate people. Empowerment is not just about improving the lives of individual girls, but allowing girls together with their peers and their communities to push forward practices and attitudes and beliefs that allow us to attain the type of society that Bell Hooks envisioned, one that is free of sexism, free of sexist exploitation, and free of oppression. You engage the girls in community work, right from when they're in school. We have a little group called Virangana, which means woman warrior. But they started, the girls started themselves. By the and so they always, it's even bringing, making sure girls are being educated. If they won't come to school, then they teach them. So what happened is, what I found is that then these girls now are becoming ambassadors, also becoming role models. So other girls say, oh, I want to be like her. I want to be like this baby. So we have been going to the grassroots because if you want to achieve an equal world, you want to get a world where young girls are equal to boys, you need to start with the communities because child marriage mostly happens in the communities. Teenage pregnancy, girls not getting access to quality education, starts with the community and the community is the solution. For the Girls Get Equal campaign, specifically in Sierra Leone, we are doing great with it, my colleagues and I, because I'm not just the only person who is doing it. Our main aim is to see girls get equal freedom equal rights to education, equal rights in making decisions, and equal rights in thriving in their community. So I would love for all educators to think about life outcomes when they're thinking about girls' education. That what kind of an education will transform their lives so that they can be equal citizens, equal persons, and autonomous. The girls are denied autonomy. And if they start thinking like that, they will understand that the traditional education for girls is just not enough. Even access, just not thinking in terms of access, completion, equality, need to redefine equality. It must include a critical feminist pedagogy. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind that if we get education right, if we can achieve gender transformative education, we can massively accelerate gender equality. Um, we've all seen the figures, whichever way you count, somewhere between 100 and 200 years before we have real gender equality in the world. We can't wait. My daughters can't wait. My granddaughters can't wait. Education is the key to everything, especially the social norm change that, that needs to happen in society. Empire young girls so that we can succeed as a nation. If you invest in young girls, if you invest in women, it's good for the long, long run, not just for today. Because as women, as young girls, we are powerful. I'm saying this again, we are powerful, we are smart, we are strong and we are meaningful. And we are partners in development. Onga is 20 and uh, in the next 20 years, Onga will be 40 and in the next 20 years, I can't wait for that world where every child, every girl sees education as a right and actually owns it. A world where every child has access to free, accessible and has very own owned education. A world where in 20 years time, I'm going to be a much older woman and then I'm going to look down and see and see younger generation of girls and I, I, I'm going to feel proud that I was part of this vision, I was part of this vision, I was part of this dream, I was part of this movement and have brought millions of young girls into the space 
with the knowledge, capacity, and with all the strength that it takes to take on the world. Hello, everybody. I hope that uh, you can hear me. I think we're online and thank you so much for joining us today. That was an amazing video. I'm Joanne Sandler, a senior associate with Gender at Work and also um, someone who works a lot with the UN Girls Education Initiative. As you all know, this is the 20 year anniversary of the UN Girls Education Initiative, UNGAI, and I wanna thank UNGAI for hosting an extraordinary week of conversations, including this one on feminist movements and leaders. That video was such an incredible testimony to the power of connectedness and the kinds of movements that have created the opportunities that we see today. A, a video like that couldn't have been made probably 20 years ago. Um, before there was this huge push for girls' education and gender equality education. I just want to say that it's, you know, we are in 2020. It is a really life-changing year. Um, COVID has also showed us how interconnected this world is. We're also commemorating 25 years since the Beijing World Conference on Women, which again was a, a moment of incredible feminist connectedness, um, the results of which we still feel today and a promise from every government of the world, which we are still calling for fulfillment of today. And so what we want to talk about today really is the, the, the cross linkages between those movements, education movements, which have generated so much opportunity and feminist movements, which likewise have been calling for equality, social justice and human rights. Um, and it, I could not be more pleased and thrilled to be moderating this um, conversation with three amazing activists, Yona Nessel, uh, who is a global public education and gender equality advocate working for PLAN, who helps turn rhetoric on the transformative power of education into action and impact. Anna Zafar, who is a human rights activist and the youth accountability advocate for restless development in India. And I should say, I think Yona is in Canada. Um, and then Kensani Nambongo, who is a feminist computer science student and girls rights defender from Mozambique, currently in Maputo, and also involved with Frida, the Young Feminist Fund. And we wanna start, before we start the conversation, Kensani has written a really beautiful poem that is very relevant to this moment. So Kensani has agreed to read that. Kensani, over to you. Thank you, Joanne. Um, I would like to start by saying that this is, this is a poem that I wrote back in 2017 uh, when we were celebrating the International Day of the Girl, October 11. And uh, it's amazing that it's still relevant today uh, and very much in the current scenario that we are living. Um, I speak out against the injustice we are subjected to just because we are girls. I speak up for the girls who are told to be quiet just because we are girls. I challenge stereotypes and beliefs that undervalue us just because we are girls. I question and fight all norms that make us feel little just because we are girls. I believe in the power and potential of us girls. And I know while one empowered girl can change lives 
all of us empowered can change the world. Thank you. Thank you, Kinsani. Thank you for that. And thank you for that message about what we can do together that we can't do alone, which again, we want to explore. And I want to start by giving you each the opportunity to answer this question. Um, you're each feminist activists and leaders in your own contexts, in your own ways. And I was hoping that each of you could identify in just one minute so that listeners can get to know a little bit about who you are. One thing that happened to you in your education when you were in school that you think contributed to you becoming a feminist activist, a feminist leader. And Yona, I'm gonna start with you. Sure, well, firstly, it's just such an honor to, to be here today with, with everybody. Um, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, I think the thing that really motivated, motivated me, and, and sorry not to start on a positive note, but was all the injustice that I, that I personally experienced and other um, girls um, experienced uh, throughout my schooling. Um, you know, I remember very vividly, um, you know, being uh, told by a grade one teacher that I didn't look the right way. I remember very vividly my math teacher saying, you know what, don't even bother. Don't even bother continuing on with math. You're not good at it and you will never do anything that required mathematics. So I think the multitude of experiences of being, um, uh, you know, let down and uh, harassed and, you know, abused uh, throughout my education and it's experience that is common to many girls around the world has re really has lit the fire underneath me to do something about it. So I'm really motivated by the injustices um, that girls and young women face throughout their education. Um, and, and, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, I experienced that as well and I don't want any other girls to have to go through that. Thank you, Yona. Injustice is actually fuel as well. You're absolutely right. Anna, what about you? Uh, thanks, Ryan. And yeah, uh, I'm also very, I feel very obliged right now to hear, like speak amongst, amongst the three wonderful women I'm seeing. And, you know, uh, if I think of one particular instance, I cannot just say, ki, okay, this was one thing which changed me or which ignited me, but but I remember myself always being driven towards, you know, uh, shows and women, uh, which which are exemplary women, and having a family family background of women leading the household. So and being seen like, oh my God, you are doing something, you know, like how is this even possible? So it used to like generate questions within me that why isn't it possible? You know, why is it such a big thing? that people find it amusing. So yeah, this was maybe something which intrigued me and similar to Joanna, is similar to Joanna, I'm so sorry, similar to Joanna, uh, like with respect to maths and science and things like that. Yes, I was subjected to the same things and to games, cricket and all of that stuff. So yeah. Thank you, Anna. And Kansani, what about you? Yeah, um, I mean, one particular moment that comes to mind for me, I think it was back in high school. Um, I remember it was like a teacher parent conference day and um, my teacher was introducing the best students in class. So I happened to be the best student in my class at the time. And I had a really high grade compared to the rest of the class. And I remember the teacher uh, making sure he introduced two people, me uh, as one of the best students in class and another person who happens to be a boy. And he clearly made it sure that he explained that uh, we as girl and boy, we were the best in class, even though like the disparity was so high and there were girls who had actually higher grades than the boy. So like now when I look back, I, I just think to myself like, wow, it's so clear how like our education system is designed to make men, to make boys thrive and succeed. And it's definitely upsetting when they don't. So I think that's like one of the moments that uh, fuels me because it's something that's still happening in so many contexts. Yeah, I have to say Kinsani and Anna and Yona that I think it is true that it is the, it's, 
it's interesting that in the education system, because as Kensani is saying, the injustice that's built into the education system or the inequities and the gender disparities are something that we have recognized for so many years. There have been so many studies, right? And still, education systems are not meeting their radical potential to, as the video says, challenge harmful gender norms. And one of the things that I wanted to talk about, particularly with the three of you, was this was something that's been bothering me for a, a very long time. Um, having spent you know, more than 40 years in feminist movements and, and activism and organizing. And I think it is fair to say that feminist movements in general, and there are certainly exceptions, have not held up education, have not focused on education as a site of change in, in, in relation to the power of that, of the potential of that site. Um, and I was looking back in 2009, actually, Ungai published a newsletter on the disconnect between feminist activists and education activists. And an author named Joanna, I think you pronounce her last name, Hore, said, rather than working together, feminist activists and activists involved in education have often pursued parallel agendas. So not conflicting, but parallel. Um, with women's rights groups concentrating on training and supporting adult women and education groups leaving the campaign for women's rights to feminists outside the formal education sector. And she asked, how might the two sides work together more effectively to achieve a shared goal of overcoming gender inequity and discrimination? Now, that was more than the, 10 years ago that she posed that question. I think that's been on people's minds. Certainly, I think about my years, as I said, of activism and the extent to which I failed to advocate around education issues. Um, and I just wondered, do you, from each of your vantage points, see any change? Has there been a greater convergence? Is there still a fissure? And what is it that you would like to see or do to bring the power of these two movements together, um, which intersect in so many ways? So, Kinsani, you ended last time. Maybe you want to start because it looks like you have some views on that. And I think from your perspective as at Frida, it would be really interesting to hear what you think. Yeah, uh, definitely, um, Joanna, I agree with uh, the question that was posed 10 years ago. And uh, as we said earlier, it's still very much relevant in this context. And uh, when I look back, I feel like within my context with the mainstreaming of gender equality um, in the last years, one thing that has happened is the like education has basically uh, Is Kensani frozen? Um, the former education system has left the call here because there's this whole idea that gender is made up. So, oh, hello, am I back? Oh. You're back. Yes. Okay, am I back? Yes. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. I was saying that um, within my context, one thing that has um, really changed in a negative way is that um, we've seen the growth of um, the feminist movement within um, formal education system, but uh, not in a collaborative way, really. It's still very much the parallel. Like uh, we have issues that happen in schools and formal education. Uh, sexual harassment is one of the big ones. And one thing that happened is that it's completely left to the feminist movement to deal with it. When the solution is really integral, it should include both parties. So I feel like one of my big hopes is to um, find the space as a feminist activist. Um, I want to find the space for us to really work together on a collaborative agenda rather than uh, working in the parallels that we're still doing up to this day. I mean, that that is a wonderful and huge aspiration. Yona, can I turn to you? You're, you live kind of at the cross section of those two, in those of those two spaces. 
Yeah, and it's and it's frustrating that uh, we haven't made as much progress as we should uh, since that question was posed uh, back in uh, 2009. I mean, I think the first thing that we have to remind ourselves of and acknowledge over and over again is that education is political. I feel like we forget that sometimes and, you know, just to remind us of, you know, the legendary Brazilian activist and, and educator Paulo Freire, um, he said that there's no such thing as neutral education, that education either functions as an instrument to, to bring about uh, conformity and maintain the status quo, or education can be used uh, for freedom and, and liberation and uh, promotion, promoting social justice and equality. Um, and so, you know, transformative education, the kind that challenges power structures and systems of oppression, patriarchy, supremacy, capitalism has always been a critical part of movement building. So it's kind of interesting that there's like, you know, this disconnect because education and movements go hand in hand, right? The kind of consciousness raising that happens within feminist movements, that's part of education. So I think for uh, for feminist movements, it's really critical to recognize and target education systems so that, so that education and education systems themselves can be used as tools or vehicles to bring about uh, gender justice um, as opposed to furthering patriarchy and other harmful power structures, which many education systems around the world still do. Um, you know, there's a subsector within education which focuses on gender equality, which you know, many of us who are members of Ungai focus on, um, but it's rare to see like true feminist framework yeah. or lenses being infused yeah. into that discourse. Um, so, you know, the education sector also desperately needs uh, feminist activists to almost like infiltrate um, and demand that kind of radical change that's necessary um, to see education truly bring about um, uh, gender justice. Um, and by bringing about that radical change within education systems, we then see young people and uh, girls and young women who are able to gain the kind of knowledge, skills, and competencies to be powerful agents of change. Um, and we see uh, young women through their education who have been empowered to be politically active and, um, you know, and strengthen feminist movements. So it's a very symbiotic relationship where feminist movements demand the transformative change necessary within education systems. And in turn, this uh, strengthens uh, feminist movements and furthers uh, you know, the ambitions for, for a more gender just world. So you know, I do hope that we're at this critical moment in time where we realize that the two sides, the two movements need each other more than ever to affect that transformative change. And I'm gonna ask you more about concretely how you think that might happen, all of you. But first I, I wanna to turn to Enna and ask you in your context, Enna, in India and in work you see in other spaces, do you see more of a convergence around those movements and, and yourself, how does that, those, that convergence manifest in your own work? Uh, I personally in India, I don't, I don't see a convergence, rather I see, you know, they are working more separately and uh, rather because when we see that uh, all over the world, we can see a rise in uh, right wing ideology where women are being objectified again and again by their bodies and everything. Uh, I completely agree with Yona and Kensani that education is very political. And when she said when she said that, I literally feel I literally felt that when we don't have people, women in politics, you know, men are making everything. So how can we even say that they'll consider converging them, you know? So uh, I'll just share an example and. Uh, recently, because of the feminist voice and everything, uh, there was a image circulating all over all across social media of a textbook, which a uh, textbook textbook from one or two grade, which portrayed women as a a, a, a rural woman as ugly, and a urban well maintained women as beautiful. So you know these are certain things which are things we are not converging. Rather, we are being on a parallel line, we are more towards diverging uh, sides. So 
and until and unless we start working together in every movement be it's of uh, black lives matter because i can see that behind her and be be it of and yeah be it of any movement we need to work together because until we are work because this is a world and we have to coexist and live peacefully and we cannot do it alone this fight is long we have to fight together so yeah this is what i think and what i have seen and have any of you seen you know i i think exactly what you're saying and that there is a greater recognition um about the importance of intersectionality right of intersectional discrimination and i think also in my work you know i was for many years at the un development fund for women unifem um and with many other social justice and feminist organizations and for many years of course we advocated for changes in laws changes in policies changes in constitutions and and there has been really magnificent change um and great achievement in those and yet we see over and over again that you can get the the law on domestic violence on criminalizing domestic violence you can get political quotas you can achieve many legal and policy changes but when it comes to implementation things fall apart uh and there's very little accountability and and you know a lot about accountability um and where is it more important or more possible to challenge harmful gender norms than in schools than in education right where do you need that 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 um coalescing of power between feminist activists and education activists more than as young people are being educated so have any of you seen any examples of those movements coming together i mean i think about like the federation of african women educationalists which i know does i think bring feminism and education together although how connected are they for instance kensani to the work that frida does in africa do you have any examples or any strategies for how in the next 10 years we might actually very consciously try to strengthen those connections and also to think about you know the fact that it's the 25 year review of Beijing and there are these action coalitions and there's an action coalition on feminist organizing and movements and what you know what how do we start to create concrete strategies that we want to propose and promote anything in particular kensani Yeah, I, I think I can uh, go back to what Anna was mentioning earlier regarding curriculums in education. I feel like until formal education starts to recognize the role that the feminist movement in educating people really because as Jana said people are formed as citizen and ideologies are strengthened and things like that happen within the formal education so it's very important for the curriculum is a strong tool for example uh i find that uh, within my context here in mozambique there is a lot happening in terms of creating this space for the feminist movement social justice can uh, for example uh, implement extra curriculum activities we can uh, work with the students within the school setting but there isn't the space for us to intervene directly when it comes to the curriculum which is the most important yeah part that the education plays it's the curriculum really so if we can um collaboration translate into for example changing or being taking part in the design process of the curriculum as well as in implementation because there is a lot of disparities in that as well it's growing increasingly important to have um gender sensitive that's like one of the key strategies that should be uh, at the center of the coalitions that are, we have or that we are creating it is frida funding any work on education this issues um our grant partners work in different um 
settings. I don't have the numbers on uh, uh, grant preparedness working specific directly or indirectly contributes that, yes. Others, any concrete ideas, Yona? Uh, yes, this, this is my life work. <laughs> I'm thinking of concrete ideas to this, uh, this question. Um, I mean, the first thing I want to say is that we need a system level approach. It cannot be piecemeal. It cannot, we cannot expect to, you know, build, uh, you know, sex disaggregated latrines in school and, and all of a sudden, you know, we get gender equality happening in and through education. We need to be able to impact every, um, every part uh, of, of the education system and not just education systems. We have to recognize that in order to achieve gender equality in and through education, education systems need to interact and work together uh, with health systems. Uh, you know, sexual reproductive health rates are so critical to achieving gender equality in education. We need to be working uh, with protection systems. We know that for adolescent girls, um, SRHR and, and protection from violence is critical for them to uh, complete their education and, and to, and to you know, get an education that is of quality. Um, you know, at the global level, we have made commitments. We've made commitments through SDG target 4.7, which no one ever likes to talk about because it's like the high hanging fruit. It's very difficult to understand how to measure it. But that target commits uh, the global community, it commits governments to ensure that education is promoting sustainability, peace and tolerance, inclusivity, gender equality, all the things that education is supposed to do. Education is not supposed to get young people good uh, exam marks. It's not supposed to make individuals competitive for an economic purpose. Yes, that's important. It's important that people come out of school with the skills they need to, have to, you know, to gain meaningful work, but that's not the ultimate purpose here. So I think we need to remind ourselves um, of the bigger ambitions and how important those ambitions are in this particular moment in time where inequalities are being exacerbated when we're destroying our planet. And if we don't do something about that, if we don't educate young people to do something about it, you know, we're kind of screwed, right? Um, so in terms of, and so let me give you, so that's kind of my rant about the global level and some of the stuff that we you know, to, need to remind ourselves. But uh, on a more practical level, I think that you can't have feminist classrooms without feminist teachers. And so teachers are really critical. And the way that we've been training teachers on gender equality uh, for, for the last little while is not great, right? It's very kind of theoretical. It's like, okay, what's gender versus sex? And you know, it's like gender 101. We have to take teachers on their own journey of consciousness raising to help them understand how gender inequality has impacted their own lives and to inspire them to make change in the classroom. So I really feel like gender responsive teacher uh, training um, is, is, is critical here. Such a good point, Yona. And, and also, you know, I always wonder, like, there is the Federation of African Women Educationalists who I think carry forward that idea of we need feminist teachers to have feminist classrooms. And I wonder in other regions and other countries, are there similar formations of teacher training and teachers who are advocating for a feminist approach to pedagogy, et cetera? Anna, from your perspective, um, can Sani, you know, mention the importance of curriculum reform, which is absolutely crucial. And Yona, you know, highlights the importance of feminist teachers and feminist classrooms. For you, what do you see as important strategies to, to make sure that these two powerful threads, because they are both powerful, come together to actually change the system, as Yona said, make sure that education is delivering on gender equality? Yeah, uh, so uh, from my perspective, see, uh, during the time my work with Brussels development, uh, I interacted with several communities living in suburban city settings, you know. Social and economic barriers are shaped by patriarchy and gender norms where parents prefer spending money on boys instead of girls. So I don't think so, uh, apart, 
with in addition to political reform having feminist teachers we need until and unless we start working and training from the basic unit of society which is our family we won't be able to achieve equality in true sense you know uh, if they if they do not uh, receive financial support for educating girls parents often don't send their girls to school as they consider it no point or benefit in it and waste of money which can be saved for her wedding so comments like you know what will she achieve after studying how will we find a good groom for her is often heard so uh, i think so under, unless we you know we start the training from the ground we start involving parents and telling them that girls and boys are really equal and we start uh, inculcating the ideas that question learn let your child question question them why there are no girls in football field so they can develop a sense of you know that okay something is going wrong you know when when they ask their girl child to come and do the household chores and not asking the boy so similarly i think so we need to you know work from the family unit as well because if we are not having family with us and just educating so you know the person may become a very you know have a feminist thought but then he or she is fighting within their own family first they are faced with challenges so and the fight with family is the most you know you can fight with everyone as they say but the fight with family is most difficult so i think so when we inculcate these three aspects together the family unit political support political representation and uh, having feminist teachers then only you know we can work ahead and work in convergence in creating more spaces yeah that's great so in involving the families involving the community right because schools are a part of the community so those are three very concrete um ideas the because I'm very conscious of the time and we only have about five minutes left. Um, and I could go on speaking to all of you for at least another two or three hours, if not two or three days. Um, I wanted to just link back again. We're celebrating 20 years of Wongai, 20 years since the Millennium Development Goals prioritized girls' education. Um, and also 25 years since the Beijing World Conference. and. People probably know, you, you all certainly do, that there is a process ongoing of bringing um, people together and, and youth advocates have a special place in this toward something called the Gener Generation Equality Forum, which I think is an acknowledgement that it is very important now um, that younger generations come in and continue the work and expand the fight for gender equality and gender justice on your own terms, right? Because the issues have changed. There has been extraordinary progress and also extraordinary backlash, which comes with great success. Um, and so that Generation Equality Forum process, which uh, is hosted by UN Women and has sponsorship from many governments, but Mexico, government of Mexico and government of France are playing special roles have also identified action coalitions. Um, there's not an action coalition on education per se. And as Yona said, Ongai and its partners and its members are advocating that every action coalition takes on the issue of girls' education and gender equality in education, which is absolutely the right thing to do and necessary. At the same time, we wanna make sure that the feminist movements and leadership action coalition is paying specific attention to the gender equality dimensions of education and has education on its agenda. So my question to all three of you is, if you were stuck in an elevator with the leader of the Action Coalition on Feminist Movements and Leaders, and you had about a minute to, to, um, to impress upon them why it's so important that that group take on a strong education agenda. In addition to what you've already said, what would you be saying to that person to make them understand 
how important this agenda is, how important it is for feminist movements to take on the education agenda as well. Which brave soul amongst the three of you would you like to start? Yona, I'm, I know you have to leave, so I'm gonna ask you to go first just in case. Well, I always think about, well, what's in it for them? Like, how can I explain it to them so they understand how this furthers their own interest and agenda? And, and, and as I was saying before, you know, feminist movements want to grow, right? They want to gain more support. They want to gain more, uh, you know, members. And, and, and how do you do that? You, you, need to, you need to create feminists, right? And, and where do feminists get, get created? In schools. <laughs> I mean, use schools are such incredible uh, vehicles, tools, sites to create uh, feminists, to create activists. We've completely underutilized the power of schools. Um, so recognize that schools are like inc incubators for feminists. Use that incubator um, to grow feminist movements and, and you know, bring about a more gender just world. Brilliant. And everybody in schools across the gender spectrum and across gender yes. identities. Yeah, brilliant. Anna, Kansani, I'm going to end with you. Anna? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, uh, I don't know how will I start with a few, uh, when I'll be in an elevator with them, but I would especially like to uh, draw the focus upon comprehensive sexual education, which is missing mm -hmm. from our educational system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, when children are intrigued, you know, children are intrigued by bodily changes. And if they, mm -hmm. if they are not being provided with the right source and kind of information, they go up to other sources such as peers or the internet, uh, where the probability of getting exposed to the wrong content is greater. Concepts such as age of consent, sexual violence, sex practices, etc. If you know, if not taught to both girls and boys, often lead to horrible experiences. In my conversation, you know, uh, with during my work in my conversation with a married woman, she informed me that there is no concept of consent after marriage, and uh, one has to comply whatever the husband asks, or else he would leave her or beat her. So yeah, this is what I want: that comprehensive, comprehensive sexual education. We talk to them since childhood, and not only to women, not only to girls, but to boys as well. We cannot. Everyone go ahead without boys and men. We need Thank to you. go together. Yeah. Thank you. And an excellent, an excellent aspiration because there is so much to be done. So thank you. And Kensani, you have the final word. Uh, well, I think uh, I would say that um, um, there's a thing actually in Portuguese that says at the beginning, which means something like uh, you can only bend a tree while it's still like in its early days. I, I think it translates to that. So like, I would say that the feminist movement and our leadership coalition has a strong role here to play because uh, it's within schools, as Yana and Anna very well emphasize, it's within schools that we find the full, the society at large really, like it's schools where we can have access to people in their early stages where they're still um, in a process that we can shape and help them uh, get, get an identity that best represents the values that we want to enforce within society. So uh, as a big feminist agenda, it's crucial that we are in this space. So like the time is now literally for us to do that and change the narrative. Thank you, Kensani. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of you and to all of you for the work you are doing and from the spaces you occupy where you can take this agenda forward and we know you will. So thank you so much. Thank you to Ungai. This is a Zoom clap. Applause to all of you. Take thank very you. good care.